Street banks for trillions of dollars and bond redemption, things like that. That's going away, and it's looking like we're going to get a bunch of new gold-backed currencies. That's what I'm hearing. It's coming from a, a few different sides, credible sources, and I'm really excited about it. But here's the, the downside or, or the rub. and it, It's like, okay, just, just a, a quarter mile away is this wonderful island. And we, we've got to swim there. And it's not going to be easy. Some people don't know how to swim. Some people can swim, but not a quarter of a mile. I can swim that pretty easily. I, I used to swim across a pond that was about five-eighths of a mile. And then I'd rest and I'd swim back. I was in my Boston days, those wonderful ponds in uh, Metro West of Boston, like uh, Lake Cochituate and Natick. But anyway, the point is we're going to have a, a challenge here. And with the dollar as reserve currency going away, at the same time, what's going to go away is the dollar-based commodity and inventory pricing system. Oh, lordy. So we're talking about a disruption to the each country's economy, each country's inventory supply system will see a disruption. So, you know, if, if a, a country has a huge shipment of coal and it comes in every three months or gasoline every three months, they're going to have to find a way of handling this without using the dollar when it was always the dollar being used. Okay, so that's what I'm hearing. We're, we got some major, major changes. This is a centerpiece to the reset. The reset is basically the, the dollar goes away as reserve currency and gold becomes the new standard. They never want to call the reset the reinstallation of the gold standard because that would be a major white flag for Wall Street, Washington, New York, London, and they don't want to do it. They don't want to describe it that way. So they call it a reset, you know, moving to the next level in progress. Now, it's going to be removal of the corrupt, toxic dollar, the end of the king dollar reign of terror. The U.S. will no longer be able to finance wars on their dollar-based credit cards with gun turrets pointed at allies, coercing them, compelling them to buy treasury bonds. Now, Jim, the U.S. has been fighting this for, it seems like, the last 15 or 20 years. Do you think they're going to try to start World War III to prevent that from happening, or are they going to finally give way and let a gold standard um, come back into being? They already did try to start World War III. Where you been? <laughs> I mean, like, actually started. Like, what do you think the Ukraine war was? The Ukraine war in February of 2014 was precisely an attempt to make World War III. It didn't work. It got localized. It got bound. So we moved to Syria. Syria is now an attempt to create World War III. We're trying to get our proxy, Turkey, to get a wider war started with Russia. It's not working. It didn't count on Russian military superiority. Didn't count on Russia exposing ISIS. I mean, I, I mentioned that the U.S. has lost its ability, is in the process of losing its ability to wage war on the, the dollar-based credit card. They still have the ability to make a war based on their narcotics chain. And that is what ISIS is. It's Saudi, Bush family, narco money going through Langley, financing the guerrillas in Syria and northern Iraq. It's a narco war. I could go on and on about this, but I'd rather not just, just leave it at that. They're trying to make World War III. This is the second venue. You could even say that the Saudi-Yemen war might be considered a, a World War III uh, venue potential. Everywhere the U.S. is involved militarily, we see destroyed nations, destroyed infrastructure, civilian deaths, and war crimes. I could go on and on about this, but I'd rather not. The point is that we are now on a centerpiece chapter of the reset, and gold currencies are within view. Every country now 
Every major country, I'm talking about China, Russia, Germany, can you say a new gold-backed Deutschmark? It's coming. I don't know about the validity of, of the Arab dinar. Uh, I think they're just too disorganized to speak with, with um, you know, coordinated voices, especially one voice. I have a joke that uh, don't expect much coordination out of the OPEC nations and the Arabs because when they get together, they can't even decide on the color of the name tags or the lunch menu. So we, we have some very interesting times here. Uh, this is climax time. We're, we're rounding the corner toward the, the end run where the gold standard is at the finish line. Uh, it's within view. And if you think this is going to have a mild effect on the gold and silver prices, you're dead wrong. It's going to have a gigantic effect, multiples higher. I don't mean like a doubled gold price, a multiples higher. So Americans are going to be scrambling around wondering, well, gee, why didn't anybody tell me gold was a good thing to invest in? Because you've been listening to the propaganda on Wall Street, the major news, the Rockefeller family outlets, the Rothschild family outlets, and you've been duped for 20 stinking years. And that makes you a dummy. That's the message to the people who have been shunning gold and silver all this time. Gold and silver will be the monetary metals. It might be a, a little bit broader because, for instance, I'm told that the Mexicans are, are all set to have a silver-backed peso. They're going to be participating. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if, if Argentina does the same? Wouldn't it be nice if Panama comes in and says, we've got gold and we've got copper? Panama has the equivalent, John, on a per capita basis compared to the United States, of 25,000 tons of gold. Their population is 100 times smaller than the United States. So what's 100 times less than 25,000 tons of gold? 250 tons of gold. Panama's ready. They've got 86 million pounds of copper. Pounds, not ounces. Pounds. They're ready for a copper gold backed Central American dollar. And they just have to make sure that they don't get murdered by the Washington crew while they're making progress. Little known fact, John, Obama administration, almost no changes in the State Department neocons compared to the Bush administration. Almost no change whatsoever. There's, there's really no change of the guard. I mean, you have a different guy in, at, at the, uh, the Treasury head. Uh, right now it's a guy who doesn't even know how to sign his own signature. Jacob Lou prefers Jack. I don't know. Why would a guy prefer the name Jack rather than Jacob? I, I can't understand that. So, you know, this is uh, it's getting fun. Now we've got some fun, but with some anxiety regarding the supply chain. Inventory supply chain. And for me here, I've been some, doing some studying. And just for instance, a few of the, the, the pieces that are going to be difficult and problematic for supply chain are going to be razor blades, car parts, gasoline, and maybe some detergent cleansers. So I'm stacking up on my Gillette razor blades. One razor blade for me is, is good for about three months. I shave every other day. I've got a thick beard, but I don't like shaving every day. That's like uh, the yoke of man. I don't wear a tie, and I refuse to shave every day. And if a gal says I don't like that, I say, that's too bad. It, today is not my day for shaving. It's every other day. we got some very fun times. This is exciting. It's going to be full of anxiety, though, because the United States does not have any gold. It's all stolen. Fort Knox has a barrel of old ounce coins. It ain't worth squat. It ain't worth even a billion dollars. The U.S., I believe, this is very hard to confirm, I believe the U.S. is going to be the recipient of least Chinese gold on condition that China runs our country. They've already foreclosed on the Federal Reserve. That was months and months ago. And now they're going to be in charge of 
say, banking policy, you know, rules and regulations, ratio requirements, collateral, lending policy, like what, what's the, what are the rules for non-performing loans and calling things a loss, defaults on bonds, covenants. China is going to be in charge. We are now going to become a vassal state to China because of all of our fraud, wars, and murders. This is the consequence. But the good news regarding the U.S. is that we're going to have some reindustrialization. I'm told it's not going to be just Chinese you know, reindustrializing. You know, by, by that I mean starting companies, buying companies, expanding companies, doing capital investment for new, new companies, hiring people, laying out big plant equipment, big money coming in. It's not going to be just China. It'll, I'm told it's going to be a lot of countries, but I, I, I believe it when I see it. I think it's going to be predominantly Chinese. Exciting times, John. So, Jim, this is climax. It certainly is. What do you see is going to be the trigger to uh, begin it all? Is it going to be Deutsche Bank? Well, to begin it all, it's already it's already happening. So it, it's not like you need you need to wait for it to begin. It's been happening now for months. But if you're wondering what's the trigger for a, a breakdown, <laughs> is that the question? Yeah, I mean, just uh, from your perspective, what do you uh, see as the likely trigger, or I guess? Um, possible triggers to uh, bring the final end game into focus. Okay, trigger for an end game. Again, the meetings have been going on for weeks and weeks and months. So we've already have progress. If you're talking about the trigger for are you talking about the trigger for a systemic breakdown? I mean, that's the second time I've asked. You just say yes or no. We'll go with yes. Okay. I think Deutsche Bank is going to be a principal fuse for the breakdown. And that's why it's been dragged out so much. Uh, I don't mean to be difficult, but th there's really a bunch. It, it's a, a set of parallel avenues that are being pursued. One is this reset with the currencies and the gold backing and gold management and, and banking system recapitalization. That, that's all on a, a parallel road. But we're seeing a breakdown of a lot of different key elements of the system. And by that I mean the bond markets are broken. They're rigged and controlled. And I, I just like to give the simple example. August, September, October, China sold $250 billion worth of, of treasury bonds, yet there was no effect at all on the 10-year treasury yield. I mean, what's that all about? It's obvious. It's a controlled market. They were all lapped up. They were all redeemed. The Fed redeemed some of them, and the Department of Treasury redeemed the rest. Okay, so what is breaking? What's breaking is the banking system, the key banks, the big banks in the West. And I, I laid out in the, in the February report that was just completed to the, the paid uh, clients, we've got Royal Bank of Scotland, RBS. We've got Barclays. We've got Society General of France, it's Societe Generale, Society General of France. Banca Intesa of Italy, Santander with main headquarters Spain and London. Um, these are the banks in addition to the biggest of all at risk, Deutsche Bank. I, I believe Deutsche Bank is delayed in its restructure. That's a nice word, restructure. Why do they do a restructure? Because it's broken, dead, insolvent, wrecked. Why do you restructure? Well, it's pretty hard to restructure. Okay, I'll give me an example. Uh, a 10-story building just got hit by a cyclone, lost all its windows, and then they came in and uh, accidentally gave it the headache ball, wrecking balls, and, and pretty well knocked it to smithereens with the demolition crew, and now there's a new group in there trying to renovate it and restructure a 10-story broken building. How do you restructure a destroyed building? Well, you tear it down to its foundation and its principal beams, do you not? Steel beams, structural foundation and steel beams. What is that? For the banking system, it's the, the capital core for the banks, and most of them are rotten bad. The steel beams are, are principal assets, 
and most of them are rotten to the core. So the banking system and Deutsche Bank could not do their restructure easily because most of the parts were rotten. I mean, I've got experience in carpentry and, you know, redo a, a room and tear down some things to the beams. And sometimes you realize, oh, look at that. The, the sill is rotten. We're going to have to replace the sill. Okay, the sill is like a foundation to a, a room that sits atop the cement foundation. So, you know, Deutsche Bank is broken. Deutsche Bank is ruined. Uh, I got some clients say, well, can't they just fix the pieces that are still okay. There are no pieces that are okay in Deutsche Bank. They're involved in, in regular commercial lending. That's wrecked. They're involved in uh, treasury bonds and sovereign bonds and, and all kinds of different other bonds. Uh, and they're wrecked because they rescued the pigs nations of southern Europe. They're involved in interest rate market with LIBOR and that's all been corrupted and wrecked. They're involved in the gold market and the gold fix, and that's all been corrupted and wrecked. They're involved in the interest rate swaps and derivatives. They were involved with, uh, with uh, London related to that, and that's all destroyed and wrecked. They're even involved in some Russian mafia investments through London, and that's all been wrecked and destroyed also. Every, every segment of Deutsche Bank is wrecked. So how do you restructure that? You don't. You, you can't. You, you need to start all over with a new entity, and they could call it Deutsche Bank, but it'll, it'll have nothing to do, no relation whatsoever to the old Deutsche Bank. So what are they doing? They're buying time to prevent a derivative explosion. One of the stories I wrote in the February report was a really good analysis by Oh, gosh, I don't remember the, the name of an investment dynamics group or, or something like well, one of those. But it's, it's in my report. And what the guy did was he said, I'm going to use the same kind of analysis that I did in 2007 regarding Lehman and a couple other big Wall Street banks. I'm going to come up with an estimate of their net value as a bank corporation. And he came up with a figure of minus $380 billion. He said, and my experience from 2008, seeing my estimate, how it held up, how it looked versus the outcomes that we saw a year later, I'm way conservative. So Deutsche Bank is worth much less than $400 billion. And that's why its stock is down 80% in the last several months. It's doing what Lehman did. I don't want to get into the whole Lehman story. That was really a, a situation where J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs were in much worse shape regarding the entire mortgage and how, uh, what do you call it, housing loan portfolios. So J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs killed Lehman Brothers by denying them all the proceeds on their asset sales until I mean, what happens to a little three-year-old kid and you put a bag over his head? What happens? You say, well, he has trouble breathing. No, he got murdered. Lehman didn't have trouble breathing. It was murdered. So Deutsche Bank is in the process of avoiding what it must do, and that is be liquidated. They can't do that because the biggest piece at risk is their derivatives. Back in 1998, Deutsche Bank unwillingly accepted an acquisition of a banker's trust. It had a nickname on Wall Street as the Fed's Bank. That means it was the Federal Reserve's principal outhouse Kaibo shithole for derivatives that Wall Street banks were relying upon. They didn't want the U.S. regulators to be down there breathing down their necks all the time. So what they did was they said to the big German bank, take bankers trust and be the derivative offshore outpost. And now that's all in a meltdown. It's all ruined. And that's the principal part uh, responsible for the, the minus $400 billion valuation of Deutsche Bank. So when this does get resolved, 
It's not going to be by a human action that says, okay, we must do this. No, it's going to be a market action. This has been done unto us. We're going to see a breakdown of, of say, Society General Bank in France, a breakdown of uh, Banca Intesa of Italy, a breakdown of, of maybe RBS. I think they're going to do everything they can to, to shore up Barclays in London. I think they're going to let RBS go because it's a stinking cesspool. RBS, Society General, Bank Intesa, those might be, and maybe Santander of, of uh, Spain, those might be your initial fallout victims from the Deutsche Bank rotten core. Yeah, I expect can contagion, John. Yes, I expect contagion. And... Uh, from what I'm hearing, it looks like uh, Wells Fargo is expecting <laughs> expecting something very, very dire. Wells Fargo. So we might, on the periphery of Wall Street, see the failures. Uh, I'd like to see City Citigroup, Citibank. I'd love I'd love to see them go into failure. I'd love <laughs> to see Bank of America go into failure. These are rotten banks that are reliant on mar narco money. They're insolvent and kept going by narco money. But I don't want to talk about narco money today. Let's talk about all the other things that are very interesting and maybe a little le less risky to discuss. All right. Well, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about gold and silver again. It sounds like you really see that gold and silver are going to roar back to life here. What do you think is going to cause that besides all of financial collapse? I mean, are we, is it going to be uh, NERP and... The, the reignition of QE, at least the publicly admitted QE? By NERP, you mean negative interest rate policy. Isn't it funny that we had ZERP, the 0% <laughs> interest policy, and it, it didn't accomplish anything, so we're going to go in the wrong direction a little deeper. But this is the problem with the Western and the U.S. and Anglo-American banking system policymakers. If they make an error, they double down the error in the wrong direction. Why don't they try the correct direction? I've got some clients say to me, Jim, gosh, they, they've tried everything. No, they haven't. They haven't tried liquidating the big banks and going to the gold standard for trade, banking reserves, and currencies. Oh, that. Yeah, oh, that. Yeah, the solution. Yeah, that. The capitalist solution of liquidate, liquidating a dead entity and carve up the best pieces Get rid of the worst pieces, toss them away, salvage them, sell them for 20 cents on the dollar. That's capitalism. Ron Paul had a quote recently. Well, we can't really blame capitalism for the failure because we haven't had any. <laughs> we haven't had any capitalism. Too big to fail is not capitalism. So what will give the big lift to gold and silver? I think it's going to be banking system recapitalization. Take a look at, uh, I'm hearing that the Basel III rules are going to be part of, of the new reset. And Basel III, I'm quite sure, states that gold and, gold and silver, principally gold, are top-tier assets. I mean, can you imagine a banking system say gold cannot be your reserves, you can't count any gold in there? No, you need to count these giant debt securities as your asset foundation and your reserve. What, what a lunatic system. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's like building a new face on a basis of acne. I don't want a face with a basis of acne. So the banks, I believe, have begun to purchase gold and probably silver. When I say gold, I'm meaning, I'm meaning steadily gold and silver, precious metals. I believe that the big banks have already begun to purchase significant amounts of gold to recapitalize their banking system, to, to reset their core capital. It's like we've got a, a sneaky event in progress, much like what Franklin Roosevelt did. Except Franklin Roosevelt only lifted the gold price by about 35 or 40 percent. This time we're going to see it by three to four fold. And, and not real slowly either. So the big banks are going to load up on gold, and that could be 
one of the main reasons, one of the main factors behind the rise in the gold price, this is the first time, the last couple months have been the first time in, in two or three years that in the hat trick letter I've had gold charts. Um, a couple months ago in January I, I had the gold chart in Canadian dollar terms. It's a big rally. And in euro terms, it's a big rally. In yen terms, not a rally. British pound terms, a minor rally. Now I have it in the dollar, an unquestionable rally. We had a rally in the last month where the gold price in dollar terms has gone above the 200-day moving average and gone above the 50-week moving average by a considerable margin. We've broken the downtrend and done so emphatically with the beginning of the new year. So, it looks to me like the world is realizing these big debt foundations are breaking, both for the banks and for the sovereign bonds. And the only asset that's doing well is gold. Isn't it interesting that gold is doing a lot better than crude oil? Wow. I got a, a real simple interpretation, uh, John. It, it's kind of funny. People say to me, but Jim, the dollar is doing very well. And I say, now I say, but wait a minute. Wasn't its, wasn't its de facto standard basis crude oil? That is what the petrodollar is, right? And crude oil is down 70%. So you're saying the dollar is doing well? when its de facto standard asset class is down 80%? No, no, you're the dumb, cr dumb little shit who looks at the boomerang because when the oil price drops, the dollar goes up. That's from all the broken petrodollar derivatives. So you're looking at the wrong clue. I like to think of it as a pack of balloons tied together, filled with helium, rising up, the helium is basically hot air, air against the Wall Street uh, executives and U.S. government leaders. So the helium fills the balloons. You've got a pack of 20 of them. They're tied together. They're rising. What happens when it gets to about, I don't know, let's say five to 8,000 feet? Pop. The external pressure is not sufficient to hold the balloon's outer structure together. And the same thing's going to happen to the dollar. It's happening right now. What is the pop? For me, the pop is a combination of things. Emerging market debt breaking down. It's between five and nine trillion dollars of debt. Gosh, wasn't that all the debt they took near zero percent, being told it was a, an easy, no-risk bet? Well, yeah, on interest rate, but not for their currency. Now, the Brazilian currency is down by 80% or 70% in the last few years. How does that have an effect on their debt? Oh, but the interest rates is still very low. No, no. It just went up by a factor of three or four because their currency is being wrecked. This is the effect of the helium balloon pack heading upward, upward, upward until it pops. Okay, the other effect is the energy sector. The energy sector is just loaded with, with uh, broken debts, broken bonds, defaults, rotten credit portfolios, and they can't really extend it much. You, you remember the story just a couple weeks ago, John, that the Dallas Fed urged in a private secret meeting the banks in the, the Southwest to extend time and, and not call in the debts, not force the default on the energy sector debts, not mark And then the they, un they unbelievably uh, tried to refute that. Uh via Twitter. <laughs> yeah, they tried to refute it, but the people who were at the meeting spoke to uh, the press anonymously, and a lot of the details got out. We cover that. Zero Hedge, got to give a lot of credit to Zero Hedge. They're a, a tremendous site for a lot of accurate stories that are on the fringe, uh, covering the, the broken nature of, of the system. Uh, on any given report, if, if I have 50 cited links on, on a, a given report, I might have eight or ten from Zero Hedge alone. UK Telegraph is another very good one. That's where Ambrose uh, Evans Pritchard does his work. 
Another new one that, that's coming out that, that's quite quite good is a new Eastern Outlook, and that's where a, uh, a colleague of mine, not a close friend at all, but a colleague named William Engdahl uh, writes. He writes about the, the German and, and Russian connections that are being reestablished. Engdahl does excellent work. But, uh, you know, we got, we got some things that are breaking in full view. Uh, I think, I think what I what I called for back in November, December is now happening uh, on on several interviews in November, especially during the Christmas holidays. I think I had four different interviews there where I stressed how the oil hedges were in the process of expiring, and the event for expiration would take place in January, February, and March, and that's now. So with a hedged I, an oil hedge expiring, it means that they they must sell oil not at the contract future price, futures contract price, but at the market price. So reality is hitting companies all over the place. They're not going to be effectively selling at 80 to 90 or $100 for oil. They're going to be effectively selling at 25 or 30 or 35. Don't know what the exact price is right now. What is it, low 30s? I don't. I don't know. I don't really care. It's it's way down from what it was. It's closer to 30 than it is to 50. And the companies that are selling oil no longer or on a far smaller basis, they're selling at the hedged value. On a much greater basis, they're selling at the market price. So. The big banks are getting ready. I heard, uh, oh, there was a, an interesting way I, it came about. It was an investor relations party in Canada for various banks. And uh, apparently someone at the bar might have had a couple too many whiskeys and said to somebody, CIBC cannot hold back their energy portfolio losses anymore. They're going to be some giant losses and it could actually be catastrophic. In other words, you might see CIBC Bank of Canada fail based on their energy portfolio. Now, remember, Canada is a big energy producer. Their banking system has far bigger commitment in the oil industry than the U.S. banking system does on a percentage basis. I mean, the U.S. has significant energy commitments in their, their credit portfolio. But on a percentage basis, Canada's is bigger. It's a bigger part of their economy. Okay, so CIBC might fail. At the same time, Wells Fargo failed. What, what, what commitment does Wells Fargo have? <laughs> California shale sector for energy? Yeah. I don't know who the principal lenders are for the Bakken in the Dakota area of the United States, north central states. I don't know. Who does? I don't know what bank does. Uh, it's funny. When I say something like that, invariably in the next few days, I get a couple or three emails from people saying, oh, I can tell you for a fact. It's mostly Citibank or it's Bank of America and Citibank for Bakken. Okay. I, 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 I like that. I, I appreciate that. And it's very difficult for me. I'm, I'm in the middle of a switchboard uh, of information regarding my colleagues and you know, I've got about 10 clients who are really good news hounds and help me out. And uh, sometimes I say, could you check Could you check this? Could you check this? Because I'm really busy right now. Could you check this? And they, they come back, and a couple guys come back with good information to help me out. But uh, I'm in the middle of a switchboard, but I, I don't have perfect information. I've got very good information, I think. Um, so the energy sector, John, is now crumbling in full view for the banking sector commitments. They can't stop it anymore. Here, here's a, an interesting phenomenon that is now coming to a halt. Okay, a, a company, I like to just use Baker Hughes. I, I don't know much about them, but I, I like them as a name because people know they're in, involved in the, in the energy field and they're not a major. They're just a very important piece. All right, Baker Hughes might have a bond that's due or a debt, commercial paper that's due. They must come up with a sum of money on March 1st. 
Let us take it backwards. They had to come up with a sum of money on January 1st. So their big bank lender, there might have been two of them, joined forces and said, we'll lend you another chunk of money so that you can cover your debt service and your bond payouts. It's called a patch loan or a bridge loan. I, I prefer patch because it's, it's something bleeding. Uh, a bridge loan is... That's more like I'm, I'm buying a big property and I got a lot of money coming in. Can you help me bridge that gap? But <clears throat> the patch loan covers a festering wound. And now the banks are saying, well, you got a March 1st loan and we've given you a patch on the last two payments. We're not going to do it anymore because it's looking very clear like you're not going to make it. It's looking very clear like you're going to enter a failure. It's looking very clear like the oil price is not going to come back over $50, which you desperately need in the next two or three months. It's looking very clear like a failure to your corporation is in progress, and we're expecting a lot worse, so we're not going to lend you the patch. That's what's happening now, John. We're to the point where the patches are no longer being applied. We're going to start seeing some failures despite what the little scumbags in the Dallas Fed dictated. They were telling the banks, no, work with the banks for some asset sales, and with the proceeds they can cover some of the, the festering wounds for payments. But even that's not going to work. I've done, I've done other stories in the last couple months about the asset sales from the energy sector, and, and they're, they're getting 30, 40 cents on the dollar for asset values. It's just not going to be sufficient. They're not, they're not able to get enough money from their asset sale. Who, who, who'd want it? I mean, I'm hearing a lot of debate. Oh, gosh, you know, in a couple of years, we should see the oil price back to $50. I'm beginning to think we're not. And there are a lot of reasons for that. It could be new technology. It, it could be uh, just a tremendous amount of supply in the world. And now Iran is coming back after sanctions with new supply. So... The oil sector is a mess, John. Breaking in full view. Yeah, it certainly looks to be the case, Jim. Couldn't agree more. Well, before we close, let's bring the interview back full circle, Jim. Just want to make sure the listeners fully understand the importance of what we started the show off with and what we discussed and the fact that it looks like the U.S., um, with, without any gold, um, if we move to global currencies backed by gold again, the U.S. either is not going to have any gold or else they're going to have their gold component is going to be leased from the Chinese. So let's, let's restress again the importance of that and what that looks like for the U.S. going forward as a nation as well as uh, gold as a currency. Well, the, the main point, there are two main points, I think. The U.S. is not going to be the, the global leader in finance anymore. And the second is that, that the United States is going to be struggling as a vassal state to China. That is very difficult for the majority of the American population to swallow. The United States has squandered its capital formation, has squandered its global prestige. We cannot invade simultaneously 12 countries and still be called a respectable global leader. We cannot be responsible for too big to fail with the banking system, rescues of backdoor bailouts, and expect to be continuing on a leadership basis with global finance. We've lost now the dollar as a global reserve. We've lost it from a combination of corruption and simple Suffocation of excess debt, saturation, debt saturation. It, it's part of a, a credit cycle, and it's a super cycle. It, it's like a 40- or 50-year cycle that, that's at work here. And the United States is, is not in a leadership position anymore. I've heard some nasty jokes. I started a couple of years ago that when global corporate offices – get a call from the United States, they don't return the call. They just don't care what they have to say anymore. U.S. corporate leaders are regarded as fraud kings, falsifying their accounting, using heavy-handed pressure, 
One of my favorite stories is uh, General Motors came under significant U.S. government ownership, and then suddenly Toyota had all kinds of product recalls. I don't think they had much of anything wrong with the Toyota parts. What they had was a need for the government to fortify its investment in General Motors by kicking in the nuts a big competitor called Toyota. So the U.S. is undergoing some changes here. Back in November or so, I had a, an interesting story in the Hattrick Letter about it was touch on a state, like, okay, let, let's touch on Alabama. Well, what do you see there? Well, there are 15 or 20 companies in free trade zones within the state of Alabama. So I focused on one, and it was a young Chinese guy in his 30s who started a copper tubing plant, a foundry. And he got uh, some, some lenient conditions from the state. He got a little bit of grant money. He got By that, I mean he had... Uh, you know, some corporate taxes forgiven for like two years. Uh, he got some some land that he was able to purchase at a discount with no property tax for a couple of years. In other words, a head start. And he had 200 employees for this little Chinese-owned copper tubing company. But here's the rub, the downside. Sure, they employed 200 people, and that's great. They're not, they're not really high paid and not with huge fringe benefits because those are going to go away also for the United States. I mean, we, we went from uh, beautiful health plans to HMOs where you had to pitch in a good deal of money and then you still had to pay something and the, maybe the service wasn't all that great. All right, but regarding this Chinese-owned copper tubing plant in Alabama, one-third of the output is pledged for export to China. And you touch on all the different states and you get a list like in New York, there are far more free trade zone companies. And you, you just follow the story deeper and deeper and most of them are Chinese. So the Chinese are investing in U.S. industry, whereas the U.S. banks are not. While General Motors and Ford are making enormous outlays in Mexico. They're also making some outlays for continued plant development in the United States and North America. I, I grant that. I was a little surprised to see that. But uh, the Mexican peso has seen a, I don't know exactly, I think about a 40% drop in the last year or more. And now it's come time for the big automakers in the United States to capitalize on that. Because the labor costs for building a truck in Mexico, or a sedan in Mexico, are 20% of the labor costs for the U.S. work. And I hear nothing bad about Mexican quality for their car and truck production. They use our standards, they enforce it, make sure it happens. So, I think we're going to see, John, a lot of uh, capital investment in the United States in the coming few years. And it's going to be foreign. It's going to be foreign. It's going to be European. It's going to be Asian. Uh, there might be some Arabs in there. But let me just make a point about Saudi Arabia before they get forgotten in this whole hour of, of an interview. I believe two countries are being led down the garden path by Washington. Those two countries are Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Um, I think Russia is going to smack them down in Turkey real soon because they're threatening to shut down the Bosporus Straits. But I'd like to focus more on Saudi Arabia just for one more minute here. When we had 45 years of, of the petrodollar standard, which is basically recycle of petro sales surplus, in other words, Saudi Arabia and the other emirates sold a lot more oil than they needed to cover their own budget. So with the surplus, they bought treasury bonds. So it, the oil was bought in dollars, and it remained in dollars for surplus savings and investment. Saudis own between 3 and $5 trillion worth of treasury bonds. They're the only country that does not disclose their treasury bond holdings. 
They're being held in a secret core managed fund called the Exchange Stabilization Fund run by the Department of Treasury. And I believe we now have motive to kill the Saudi regime. If we lead them into a war in Yemen where they buy military weaponry from the United States, if we lead them into a war with ISIS in Syria where they buy U.S. weaponry from the United States, we can both have a customer for our goods and a victim for our lead policy. And if the, the Saudi regime falls, which I think is a guarantee, I've been saying it for two years now, then we can expunge the three to five trillion dollars in debt that the Saudi owns of the U.S. government. So why do you think the Saudis are embarking on a stupid war in Yemen and a stupid war in Syria? Maybe because Washington is suggesting it, where they buy U.S. military weapons, and when it's all done, the regime will fall, and we will kiss goodbye that secret three or five trillion dollar debt that they own. This is Mafia 101, John. If Al Capone owed, owed a lot of money to a guy, and he found out that the guy was not well protected, the guy would be dead in 24 hours and the debt would be gone. That's how Al Capone managed his debt. We're no different in Washington. It's ugly. Almost everything about U.S. finance and political policy is ugly. I just learned that Hillary's main campaign contrib contributors are Republican. I I've said for a long time, it, you know, it's, what do you want, the red-coated Nazi fascist or the blue-coated blue fascist as president? Doesn't matter to me. Oh, boy. I tell you, the choices for president are pathetic. Uh, but anyway, what, what's coming for the United States is a wake-up call. Uh, I think most Americans are going to finally wake up.